anyone who's like dabbling in this right now, you've probably seen it's just it's just going nuts right now. Like you can get so much reach organically just by being a video creator on LinkedIn. I think this is going to be a job yeah. role now. I think they're literally you're going to hire like a creator on staff and their job is literally to do this type of stuff. No one wants to take a cold call. Everybody wants to be a guest on your podcast because it's like, <laughs> oh, I, it's. I get it's your 15 minutes of fame. Welcome to the In The Pit Podcast. I'm your host, Cody Schneider. Today, we're having my friend Zach on the show. Zach is going to share with us how he's using short form LinkedIn content to create demand generation for the B2B company that he's working at called Reveal AI. It's super, super interesting because it's a very complicated space that they're in. They do market research. And so it's a hard thing to make content for. But he's going to talk about the content formats that are working for him. He's going to talk about the content formats that are working for them and how to implement this at any company. This episode is brought to you by Swell AI. Swell AI is content repurposing powered by AI. Go to swellai.com and sign up for free. It's also brought to you by Draft Horse AI. Draft Horse AI is AI powered programmatic SEO for blog post content. Go to drafthorseai.com to sign up for free. And it's also brought to you by landingcat.com. Landingcat is AI powered programmatic SEO for e commerce stores. Go to landingcat.com to learn more. All right, let's get started with today's show. Jack, what's good, man? How you doing? What's, what's going on, dude? I'm psyched to be here. We in the pit right now. I love it, man. I'm hyped you're out here. How you been? It's been a minute, man. I think it's been a couple months since I talked to you last. Uh, yeah, I've been seeing you on LinkedIn and like here and there on Twitter and stuff. But yeah, it's been a minute since we like hopped on a call. But it's been crazy lately, honestly. It's been... Dude, I, when you reached out and we're like, yo, I got stuff to talk about. So I was like, we got to have him on the show. So it was perfect. Yeah, it's been going it's been going pretty nuts lately in a good way. Uh, For the hyped. uninitiated, what are you doing and like what's your back? I, the, your company that you're at right now is super interesting. So I think just to give context for this. Yeah. So basically, I'm the head of demand gen at uh, Reveal AI. Basically, we are an audience insights platform. And what that means is we basically have two key products. It's, we have conversational surveys. So we use AI to run like one-to-one personalized surveys for people to do like market research, audience research, stuff like that. And then we have a social listening product where we can basically take a bunch of unstructured data from essentially anywhere on the internet, Reddit, TikTok, whatever, analyze all of it and basically tell you what tell you what people are saying at scale so if you're like man i got ten thousand comments on this like viral thread i wish i knew what people were saying so i know what they want more of what they want less of whatever that's basically what we do with social listening and with the surveys it's the same thing it's usually if you run a survey to a thousand people and it's like open-ended responses you're like what do i do with all this so we just make it easier to make sense of all that oh it's super fascinating Um, man who's your kind of like core customer base just to understand like who you guys are trying to get in front of yeah so we're we're primarily b2b and right now we sell a lot of market research firms. So essentially, if they're doing large scale surveys, the crux for them has always been like doing qualitative research at scale. So that's like asking open ended questions, right? So we basically go we embed into their survey platforms and allow them to run conversational surveys. So you can ask follow ups in real time. And if someone says something interesting, you can ask for more detail, they go deeper. So We've been a big hit in market research. Talked to a lot of folks who are like VP of audience insights. So there's some media agencies, marketing and comms agencies, basically anyone whose job it is to know about customers so they can sell to them better or create better content for them. If that's your job, like that's basically who we help right now. That's super interesting. Sweet, man. We're just going to jump into it. Talk to me. You When you reach yo, out, you're go. like, yo, I've got, we just got pipeline locked in right now. So what's your whole flow looking like <laughs> from the content side? From what I've been seeing, you're basically, it looks like you're using the LinkedIn arbitrage that exists currently for like short form content, but then you incorporate the products to reveal into that content. Is that kind of what you're doing? And then could you walk me through like your step-by-step tactical of how you're deploying that? Big time. Yeah. So you heard it from Cody first, the LinkedIn arbitrage, it's not going to be around forever. So you got to hop on it. (laughs) But basically been using short form video on LinkedIn to blow up the top of funnel. And anyone who's like dabbling in this right now, you've probably seen it's just it's just going nuts right now. Like you can get so much reach organically just by being a video creator on LinkedIn. So when I saw that, which all credit to you is like really who put me onto that. I was like, okay, we need to make Top of, top of funnel content, right? Because what we also do is like we run a podcast, right? And that's like a good way to make video, but it's a little more niche. It's a little more like mid funnel, right? And so I was like, what can we do that's going to blow up the top of funnel that's like broadly interesting to people, right? And this has been my, I call it like key insight recently is like, how can you combine interesting, entertaining content with what your product does? Because usually those things get separated. So you have maybe some influencer content that's top of funnel and then you have product marketing sitting over here and it's some nerdy, here's what our product does and all the stuff it solves. How do you do both? What I said is, okay, 
I'm going to take our product. We have this social listening capability. I'm just going to go find the most viral Reddit threads, or the most viral TikTok videos, take oh, all that data, drop it into the product, and then be like, yo, here's some really interesting stuff I found on the internet, right? Here's what's blowing up on Reddit. I did you one about validated, like You already know, like by proxy, it went viral previously. So you already know that yeah. this is a viral idea. So you're basically just like picking me backing off of that viral idea within the content that you're doing. Super interesting. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So you already have some like market validation of that piece of content. And then the key is that because some people will just recycle content, they'll be like, here's a cool thing I found on Reddit. And they just like repost it to Twitter or whatever. And it's, that's fine. But, but it's when like, you remix angle? it that. Yeah. And how do yeah. you re remix it for your brand so that it provides brand value to the user? And then that like creates basically it's demand generation what is what you're doing, but you're using exactly. the super interesting. And it's there's it's like a you want the intersection of I want this to provide brand value. I want it to provide provide value to our ICP. So it's if you're in audience insights and you're like, I want to know what everybody's saying about my brand on the internet, but you're like, oh, shoot, this like totally does that. But then if you can add the layer of it's also just broadly interesting, like that kills, right? I did one about Chipotle. They went viral because their portion sizes are all out of whack. People are like complaining or whatever. Everyone already knew that that conversation was already happening. But I was like, what if I could tell you specifically what these people are saying at scale about Chipotle. And there were some interesting insights in there. Actually, you get different portion sizes if you order online versus in person. Because if you're in person, you can stand there and mean mug them until they give you more meat in your burrito or whatever. And so it's these kind of funny insights that you could only get if you can really dig into the data of what people are saying at scale. So I turned that into video content and it hits the sweet spot of like, it's pretty entertaining. Like even if you are never going to yeah, buy from brand us, like, that they know. That's kind of fun. Yep. yep. And then it's like, Here's something fun about Chipotle. Our ICP is, oh, that's cool. I could use that for my brand. And then our product is like literally green screened into the background. So you're just seeing it in action. So that's been the, so, that's dude, been the play I feel like lately, that, basically. I love it, man. I love it. Talk to me about what's, what are you seeing from an impression standpoint on a monthly basis with this type of content? And then are you driving them deeper? Are you like putting them into an email funnel? Or are you putting them into a podcast? Or Yeah. So that's, that's the next step, right? So on the impressions front, so like literally... I hopped on this almost to the day, like 28 days ago, which is like one of the look back periods for LinkedIn impressions. Yeah. And actually, I, I have one that's like blowing up right now. But last I checked, we were over 200K impressions in 28 <laughs> days. And just for reference, I'm not a big account. I have, I just cracked you a thousand followers. On followers LinkedIn, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not like, I'm not like big man on LinkedIn. It's, this is crazy for me. 200K in a month. I'd like to hit a million before the end of the year. Basically, that's like a, a goal that I have. And totally. it's from cranking out videos is that honestly I actually posted a video about my workflow is not very time consuming especially because no, totally. the product is a lot of the work yeah, so. you can crank them out in 10 minutes now i think this is going to be a job yeah. role now i think they're literally you're going to hire like a creator on staff and their job is literally to do this type of stuff but i'm curious Dude. to get your thoughts there your role is that you're like a head of content is what i'd almost call it like at the company that you're at is what <laughs> it feels like and you're like your job is like create demand generation but i i know you're doing way more than that you're like functioning basically as like their head of growth but yeah it's yeah, I'm like the basically end to end demand gen. We're, we're a super early stage startup. And also like we haven't taken venture capital. So we're we're bootstrapped. And so we don't have a crazy ad budget. We don't have six SDRs out there like banging the phones or whatever. So it's when I came on, I was like, man, this is a pretty small target to hit. It's totally we need to build a brand from nothing. Like we had no web traffic, no brand, like basically from scratch. And we got to do it on a pretty slim budget. Totally. And so finding something that works organically has been like really crucial. But yeah, I'm basically doing like the content creation. I totally agree. What's funny is I can see it going two different ways. One, this could just be its own job, right? It's like just the content creator. It's like your on staff content creator, right? Yep. I also think it's going to be like a necessary skill if you're in go to market generally. And so yep. What I mean by that is, I don't know, you see a lot of people talking about like outbound is dead. No one picks up their phone. No one. I, I don't know if it's dead or not, but I do know that the traditional SDR motion, it's like it's expensive to have SDRs on staff. If your ACV is super low, like it's really hard to justify like a big SDR team or a big sales team in general. And so I think those people are going to have to augment themselves by becoming social creators as well. And that's going to be one channel that they're using to drive pipeline and hit their number. So instead of being like, I'm an SDR, 
SDR, I sit over here, I just bang on the phones and I send out emails. It's if you can also basically be a social creator because the tools are so easy to use. It's a whole other world where you can blow up and you don't have to be the founder anymore to do this, right? It doesn't have to be like founder led content or whatever. You can be an SDR just blowing up in your own little like world. And that's how you're getting in front of people. That's going to be your differentiator of you bring your own audience into these companies. And that's how you negotiate higher salaries or whatever, like larger, per- larger percentages off of deals closed. I think this is, again, the, the future of all. I, it's funny, like marketers for them, it's do you have an owned audience, like own distribution? And then like SDRs is like the same thing or sales individuals is the same. It's your network used to be the way that you differentiated yourself. Of who do you know and what's your Rolodex? And now it's, yo, who's your audience and are they interact? What did they interact with? And that, it's an interesting way to think about that now and how that's changing. Dude, totally. And I think the flip side is also going to be true, not to like scare marketers too much, but uh, especially from where I'm sitting, because we're early stage. So I basically, I make the social content that drives like inbound demos. And then when you get on that demo, guess whose face you're seeing on the other end yeah, of the call? It's, you. it's, it's me yeah, again, yeah, right? Totally, and then when totally. you're like, oh, you're like qualified you're in the sales process now, guess who's running the sales process? Yeah. So it's you could think- probably remix those too, right? So it's, oh, it's, you could do the same idea, but for like different team members. I'm just imagining like, oh, here's this like playbook for you guys to go. Basically, we know that pieces of content like XYZ performed really well for the past for this person on the team. So you go do the same content as a way to get out in front of them. It's just remixing that that same idea over and over again for with new people, et cetera, or whatever that ends up being, just slight variation. So... Dude, totally. I think it's going to be like whether you're a market, it's like if you're a salesperson, it's probably good to start figuring out how to make content because it's just like yeah, such yeah. a valuable channel. If you're a marketer, it's also good to learn how to sell, honestly, because totally. like you you get so many insights out of those like sales conversations. A thousand percent. Under, yeah. So it, I, I, my guess is go to market is like maybe going to collapse into like more of a sing, not single thing, but it's not going to be so siloed. Yeah. And it's just like, by nature at early stage startups, it's just not right. Cause you don't, we don't have a sales guy sitting over here and a marketer sitting over here. It's just right now it's just one person. Totally. No, that's interesting. Talk to me about the data. So you got, you said about 200,000 impressions in the last trailing 28 days. What does that look like from like inbound volume and just like rough numbers on like pipeline that that generates off of something like that for people? Yeah. So it's been really cool to kind of report or y- y- sometimes you have to guesstimate a little bit on the ROI because you're like, well, yeah. I posted this video and then all these inbound demos came in. So and then you can ask them on the call, yo, where'd you hear about us? But uh, yeah, it, like we're doing like 200K impressions in, in a month right now. That's driving a good chunk of inbound demos. And so just that Is alone like 5% would make percent to put like a solid number on it or what does yeah, that end so, up being something. or 1%? Yeah, something like that out of 200K. It's still where it, it's driving five to 10 demos in a month. And so right. that's, those aren't huge numbers, I understand, but also like for where we are in our growth, it's like actually great for us. <laughs> that's no, like, no, no, no. Yeah, know, if, if we're driving stage. that. If we're like driving that month over month and then yeah, especially with that type of, I'm just thinking about like that audience, that's super niche and hard to get in front of. Like also your deal size is probably massive, right? Like if you close like a huge media company, like that's a easily, a, you know, that hopefully a couple that's million the other type of deal. So that's the other thing is if, if we get a couple good fit customers get in front of a couple of these and one of them closes essentially like the ROI is just like massively positive on all of those sure. like content creation efforts. Other thing I was going to say, because I know that especially marketers, like depending on what stage your company is at, there might be a lot of pressure to like push on attribution and be like, hey, how is social actually connecting like downstream to revenue or whatever? And it can be hard, right? Because if someone sees your LinkedIn video and a month later books a demo and never tells you about it, like it's even if that drove like a, a inbound demo or whatever, you you might not know about it, right? So other things that I'm looking at, aside from just the demos, is if these videos are blowing up, I start seeing who starts following me. And all of a sudden it's like head of market research over here, head of qualitative research over here. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, you are like the exact person that I would want to go outbound to. But now you're not quite requesting a demo yet, but you're coming to me and you're like, I want to be friends with you on LinkedIn. And I'm just like, it's so much better now to be like, hey, super happy to connect with you. Did you check out the video that I just posted? Like any thoughts on that? What are you guys doing for research over at your place? And so it's just even just that alone, is way better than just trying to do cold outbound and getting like these really crappy reply rates or open rates or whatever. It's bringing people to you and like into your ecosystem. And now they're a follower. And now they're going to see Right. Like you're using content as a top of funnel for community. Talk to me about that. You're doing these clips. Like how are you driving them to the podcast? Because that's probably the deeper affinity and relationship management or sorry, the relationship building that you can create. But I'm just curious how you're figuring out that funnel and what's working for you. Yeah. And the disclaimer is I'm still figuring it out. So it's I'll, I'll tell you what's working and like what yeah. what I've been seeing. Like I said, that blowing up that top of funnel 
it's getting us some demos. It's getting us connection requests with our ICP, which is just so money. And then you're like, okay, this person's showing like some level of interest in what we're doing. So what you can then do, there's a couple ways I've been like leveraging those either connections or insights of who's engaging with the content. I'll check that against who's hitting our website. So if you have like Clearbit or RB2B, they're doing like person level identity for who's hitting your website. You can see, oh, this person saw the video. Here they were, or here's their company on our website. I'm going to go outbound to them. And what am I going to do? is I'm going to reference the content that I'm pretty sure they saw. So you can reference that. You can take that top of funnel content, stuff it into your outbound sequence because you've already validated that content rips, right? If it did, I have whatever video I just did yesterday is like at 75,000 impressions. So if I take that, and that was a podcast episode. So if I take that and stuff it into an outbound sequence to our ICP, and it's here's me interviewing this like expert in your domain, it's giving us a lot of credibility. That's going to drive clicks right or that's going to drive just, them to say just for context yeah. for people for this video has 20 likes all right or 20 yep. inter- engagements 10 comments that's all this has and it did seventy five thousand impressions just to throw this uh, out so people understand the scale does that sound yeah. right uh, yeah that's totally right and i actually that's a really good note cody is like You got to balance if you try too hard to blow up like super top of funnel to where you're creating stuff that's so broadly entertaining that it's almost not applicable to your ICP, you might see engagement go down. And there is a sweet spot that you have to hit. And I'm finding that right now where it's some of the social listening stuff I'm doing. There's a really nice intersection of it rips and our ICP is, wow, this is super interesting. I saw you on LinkedIn and I want to do a demo. There's other stuff that say it was maybe a little too broad and cool. People like saw it, but it didn't drive a lot of engagement or whatever. And so that clip you're referencing from yesterday, that's actually way more mid funnel where I had this awesome director of demand gen on the podcast and we were talking and and that's a clip from that. But uh, yeah, not a ton of engagement. Like the vanity metrics don't look super good, but then the reach is just going crazy. And then what you can't see is all the connections actually that literally came from that video of people who are in like the market research space and now they they want to be friends on LinkedIn. Interesting. Are you emailing yeah, all those people like when they connect, like just like out going scraping their emails and then uh, reaching out to them or being more softer on your touch? I'm actually going a little bit softer on the touch because right now we're not playing like a crazy volume game. It's just for where our like annual contract value is for the size of some of the clients that we're going after. Like we don't, I don't need a thousand new customers this year. So we can actually be a little bit more targeted, play a little bit more of the long game. Yep. And I think for us, that's been the sweet spot. I definitely tried the thing early on where I was like, I'm just going to rip a thousand emails a week to everybody who can conceivably buy this product. And like the open rates are pretty abysmal. The responses are pretty abysmal. But finding even if I find five to 10 good fit folks who like want to connect with me and we can start a conversation and one or two of those turns into a sales opportunity, that's amazing for us. So there is definitely a way to scale what I'm doing and be a little bit more automated and like higher scale. Right now, I'm just describing what I'm doing, which is like, I'm a team of one and I don't need a thousand customers by the end of this year. So like that kind of informs like the softer touch approach. Totally. Man, that's super fascinating. Okay. So talk to me. So the podcast piece, you're including that in the the like your cold outreach stuff or how where does that fit into this whole like how so you said okay are are you sending that hey we had this industry expert on the show and then you're reaching out to people and being like john joined our show (laughs) listen to the episode here and because they already know he exists you're like tapping into his almost i don't even know what you would call it like industry trust uh, as like a, a vector to do growth does that sound right that's totally right so i got actually I got a few good notes on the podcast for people who are like trying to roll out this type of strategy. So first things first, with our podcast, it just lives on YouTube. Actually, we don't even publish like the RSS feeds. Maybe we will one day, but really my goal. What's it called, Zach? Just so I can look it up. The Insight Innovators. And it does. we don't have a lot of views on YouTube. I'm going to be totally real with you. It's not blowing up on YouTube. We we post a lot of shorts. Those tend to do a little bit better. Yeah. But essentially what the goal of the podcast is one to give us a a content pillar so we have consistent video creation right because like from early on i was like look video is the medium how do we create a content flywheel that we always just have like cool valuable video content to send out to our audience and so one of the best ways to do that is get the people who are the most respected in your icps like industry get them on for a conversation and then essentially make them famous. No one wants to take a cold call. Everybody wants to be a guest on your podcast because it's like, <laughs> oh, I, it's, 
I get it's your 15 minutes of fame or whatever. And for sure. we've gotten to the point where I actually have Dude, people. Dude, it kills me. Sorry, like, I just got to interject here. Like we, like we see this data where it's you're selling these people, they won't respond to you. And you just send them a LinkedIn DM and you're like, hey, name, love the content you're making here. We'd love to have you on my podcast named XYZ. We have an email newsletter that it gets sent out to with 5,000 subs on it. And we'll give you clips back for your social. And we see the about a 20% response rate on that. For And we're talking like ICP, right? These are people that like, yep. you're trying to sell and you're getting 20% response rates. And like, yes, I want it. And then that just turns into, oh, yo, you just go and basically build, like you build a relationship with these individuals. So anyway, Dude. yeah, I just want to throw that out there because I think it's like the most just OP like form of B2B that I've ever seen like in my career 10 plus years of doing this stuff so dude I totally agree and like the actually like the asterisks I want to put on this for people is you got to do it in the right way so there's the what is like the podcast like content motion but the how is actually really important too so it's really transparent if you're like I was trying to sell to you and it didn't work. Now just come on my podcast. And then as soon as I'm done with the podcast, I'm going to try to sell to you again, right? Like people realize, yo, this is just like a, an end run around to get me into a sales call or something. And so I think the goal is you should play the long game and just recognize that by talking to these folks, you're going to get awesome content. That's super huge for you. You're going to tap into their audience, which when we were starting, we still are a small brand. We're still super small, but we were even smaller when we started, right? And we don't have any distribution, but they do. If you make great content that they want to share with their audience, that's amazing for you, right? And then some of their industry peers are going to see it. And then a really key note here is that the podcast is not just, it's not just the content flywheel. It's like an insights flywheel as well. So when you're talking to literal experts in your industry, they're going to be sharing their problems, what's been hard historically, like where they see the technology progressing to, where they see like the whole industry moving. All of that is like crazy valuable information for you because you can hear how they talk about it in their own words and then take that and turn that into website copy, turn that into a LinkedIn post, turn it into put it in your outbound. Like I actually had one that was... I talked to someone who's analyzing survey open ends is a huge time suck, right? And so that's why we don't do a lot of qualitative research. Guess what was in my next outbound email? I know that survey analyzing survey open ends, it's probably a huge time suck for you, right? I get that. And here's what we do, right? It's literally customer <laughs> it's like, research in, dis- in disguise. So you're yep, going to feel, yep. you're going to hear the language. It's almost like a problem solution identification tool, which is ridiculous. Absolutely. And it's also, I it's think like, that's like the LinkedIn, like what I'm seeing be successful is here's this problem you're having. And here's the solution that incorporates my product into it. Like yep. having a content team is a team is expensive. And then here's the solution, whatever, Swell AI as an example. That's like literally right. that's what I, I, I did two weeks ago and it ripped. And so I, anyway, I, I think that's like, it's funny, the, the long form probably initiates all the short form too, because you just found like all of these pain points that the your target audience is having. And then you can address those within the short form and then show them how they can like basically use the, whatever the, your software solution or whatever it is their product is to sell that that solution to that problem. That's totally right. And you can also... It's, you can connect it to your product, but you can also connect it to a larger, I don't know, point you're trying to evangelize for the industry, which could be like right now we're selling to market research firms. AI is like a brand new thing for market research. It's a slow moving industry. So people aren't all over it the way they might be with yep. like a product like yours, for example, where people are like, give me the AI content creation platform. One of the nice things can be is like, even if you're not evangelizing your specific product, having yep. experts come on and be like, hey, this whole AI thing isn't actually so scary. Like we should be embracing it and exploring it and using it to move our industry forward. Having them preach that message at scale to their audience, which is also your audience, is super powerful as well. It's just like another, it's like another angle you can think about it. Totally. Man, that's amazing. Okay. What are you seeing as the opportunities right now? Are you just going for volume on LinkedIn for shorts? Or what's the things that are you're, you've stumbled into or on your horizon? Are, are there are any other marketing arbitrages that you're seeing currently? Yeah. So the kind of dumb way that I would explain this is one mode of content creation is use your product to do cool shit and use it to do cool shit in public, right? So I know we touched on this a little bit with here's how I'm basically like, I'm finding interesting social posts and then analyzing the data and using that to tell a cool story and create content for social. But there have been, I've seen a lot of other examples of this where people, they either turn some aspect of their product or some aspect of their role into interesting, like consumable content. So one example of this is I recently listened to a podcast with this girl, Sarah Plowman. She's like a, she's a sales leader, right? 
Yep. She actually just got married, so she changed her last name. I don't know what it is. But anyways, Sarah has this whole like TikTok thing she does where she just records herself doing cold calls, right? And sometimes they bomb and sometimes like they're awesome, right? And, and what does she sell? She sells sales training. And so it's like to whatever extent you can in public demonstrate something that's cool and valuable to your audience that is like either based on your product or like tangentially related to your product is like a huge opportunity. So I don't know, I thought about it for you, Cody. And I think you do this to an extent right now where you'll be like, hey, I just started this new website yesterday that didn't exist. And I published 40,000 blogs and indexed them all using our tool, right? And here's the graph of it just going bananas vertical on search volume, right? And so just doing stuff like that, where you're like, yo, my product does this thing. Here's me doing that thing in public in this cool way. And then people can be like, this is so much better than a demo because you're like literally doing magic in front of me. It feels like. It's That's what it feels like. So yeah. it's whatever it is your product does, find a way to create that type of content for social where it's like entertaining and it's basically you flexing your product or flexing your service or whatever it is you do. I think that's like a huge I think opportunity. For a lot of people, this is super hard though. Like, how do I find like a cool way to illustrate this? I think what you're doing is very interesting where it's I go and I find already viral content and then I'm basically, how do I apply this to my own thing? Do you have, is there like a more of a general framework that you would suggest for people that are trying to figure out, okay, what is the cool thing that my, my thing does? Or is it just, hey, don't even think about it like that. Just focus focus on whatever that problem is, like hit that pain point as much as you can for the the content that you're creating. And again, I don't know, I, this is a very open ended question. But I think <laughs> no, this is a hard thing for a lot of people, especially marketers is what is like, how do I make a thing cool? That's a very hard question to answer. Yeah, I think it connects to like another concept that I've been thinking about lately, which is like content market fit. And people always talk about product market fit. But I think that is something that marketers should be striving towards, which is finding content that basically sits at the intersection of it's your product demonstrating a lot of value. It's really interesting to your ICP. And it's a format that like rips on whatever channel it is that you're that you're trying to blow up on. And so if you can hit that's like the three things of, like at that intersection, I think that's when you figure out like this is what's really going to work, at least for some amount of time for our brand. And I think that the journey to that content market fit is is it's highly personal to to different people, right? I don't have off the top of my head a super good framework of like, here's how I would take any product and do this, but I'm trying to think of maybe an example. Like the example I gave for you, I think is a pretty good one of this is what my product does. I know that I love when I look at your Twitter and you're like, here's the domain I bought yesterday and it's literally just crushing all of y'all's web traffic already. And I'm just like, <laughs> that's so cool. Totally. So like, I think that's a really good example. But I would encourage people to think, what does your product do that you basically would love to show off and like flex on social media and then find a way to do that and turn that into content that people want to consume? Yeah. Do you think about uh, like repeatable playbooks? So have you thought that your best performers, are you coming back to those and then almost rehashing them or, or turning that into a regular part of your content schedule? Or how, how are you thinking about that? Or like, how are you analyzing the data of what's working most effectively? Yeah, absolutely. Because as a, a team of one, you got to have like pillars that you can fall back on. And so that's one of the reasons I love the podcast. And again, credit to you, because you're literally where I, I learned this from is like having the having that long form content and then just using taking that and turning it into short clips. And I'm like, boom, I just got two weeks worth of social content that I can post to LinkedIn and to YouTube shorts and whatever other channels you're on. We just do those two for the most part, like that repeatable content format is really good just from the content creation standpoint. That doesn't even touch on all the stuff we talked about where it gets you relationships with your ICP. It like taps into their audience, yeah. like all that other stuff. So that's one. The other one, like to my point about the journey to content market fit, like I basically, I feel like I just found it, honestly. Like I've been making the podcast, I've been grinding on it. Like it, it never super blew up. And I think what happened is I went and found this use case that's it's a little bit tangential. So instead of that kind of mid funnel, like interviewing experts in our industry, I'm like, here's another research based thing where I'm like analyzing all this social data. So that's still interesting to that ICP. But it's also just a little bit more like fun and entertaining. Taking that and seeing that blow up on LinkedIn, also right place, right time, because LinkedIn is just like going nuts right now. I think that was when I was like, this is the format, right? Like, this is the top of funnel format. Now I have my mid funnel with my podcast. And then from there, it's we actually don't do much product marketing, to be honest. I don't do a lot of posts about like, here's what our product does and solves your problem. So we don't really have a, ball of, a bottom of funnel. It's more like you talk to me on a demo and that's the bottom of the funnel. But yeah, like identifying those winning formats and then just like leaning into those super heavily and having a repeatable process is like 
super important. No, totally, totally. So this has been amazing, man. Talk to me about what do you need help with right now? Is there anything that I, you just want to soundboard or anybody I can try to intro you to or that type of deal? Or like just even just get this in front of a bunch of people if you're trying to figure something out? Oh, man, that I was I was not ready for that question. If you had to add like a layer to or, OK, I, I'll tell you a layer that I'm exploring right now. How about that? Yeah. And you can no, workshop great. in real that's time. Great. Yeah, I think this will be good. So here's the next layer that I've been adding on. I've had people coming inbound to me being like, yo, I saw that you analyze like that thing about Chipotle. Can I use your product to analyze like my own TikTok comments? And I'm just like, we don't have a free trial. We don't even have a self-serve product, right? It's still like very manual implementations because historically all of our customers have been like much bigger yep. enterprise. And but I'm just like, heck, yeah, you can just tell me what you want to analyze. I'm going to give you a dashboard and then I just want you to make a piece of sh- social content about it and just say, hey, here's some things I found out about my LinkedIn or my TikTok audience. And by the way, I used Reveal AI to do that. That's like the move that I'm going towards. I've had a couple bigger creators like reach out who wanted to do that. What do you think about that? Is that like a cool kind of like influencer play uh, or what would you do differently? Or I'm or seeing it, this you know? more and more of everybody's calling it prosumer, but I, I think it's something entirely different that's starting to happen. There's like this almost like a free tier to test drive this thing. Then you have a $29 tier. So it's okay. Like a consumer could use this or like an SMB or an influencer could pay for this. And then you have a, whatever that is, a $995 tier. It's just enterprise is the only level up from that. Yeah. And I'm, and the reason for that is they want this word of mouth thing to happen. If there's a, if you're naturally getting pull from that, I would be like, tomorrow, how do you open the product up and make it so that people can pay you? Is I just see this play to instantly where it's, Hey, I just went to, here's famous person X. So I just went to Billy Eilish's comments. Here's what, here's all the data that we analyzed with it. And it's just like, boom, like here's what all, all the insights that you pull out from that. I'm just imagining that as like a tool for influencers to understand their audience. Like I could see that. And also I can just see that content going viral more and more. I'm just like, like, I'm just thinking about how do I build it so that people Google my name more, right? Like, how do they, how do I make it so that they Google Swole AI more? Or how do they make it so they Google whatever the thing is that I'm building? Because that is a diff- tradition. It's easier than ever to do marketing at scale, right? Like you, programmatic mm-hmm. SEO is easier than ever. Sending an absolutely insane amount of cold email is easy. I say that, but simultaneously, like all of our cold email for clients this morning, just like basically nuked itself because we don't know what even has happened. It's, it looks, <laughs> looks like something to do with Microsoft domains or Microsoft inboxes. But anyway, yeah. So what I'm getting at is I think that from a defensibility standpoint, because it's becoming so much easier to do growth at scale, you the only way that you're going to be able to really fight with a product is like, are people just looking for your name, right? That's very hard for people to take away from you long term, right? They can always spend more money than you on Google ads or Facebook ads. They can always <laughs> make more landing pages than you on programmatic, they can always build more links, et cetera. But it's very hard to like take away like somebody that is going out of their way to search your name, right? And then right. trying to cannibalize that traffic or, or those people away from that company. So I think for me, if I was in your shoes, I'd be thinking about what are these activities that I can do that will just at a larger scale create. Also, I think that there's like a value in this as well, right? Like when you go and if you guys raise or whatever, whatever you end up deciding to do from a company standpoint, if you can show like, yeah, like all of our traffic comes from organic searches, but it's people searching our brand name, right? Like, Every person that that's like a, a huge, ma- you know, get in contrast to being like, oh, they're searching for this random keyword and they land on a blog post and then they come to the product. It's way different when people are just going out of their way to, to come to that to that specific company, like they're searching for that specific company. So more and more, I'm thinking about that as product is becoming less and less defensible unless you build your own AI model which is its own thing. <laughs> and we're seeing this more and more, right? Like we're just starting to see this, I feel like in uh, early AI where they use like a base model to solve the initial solution. And then they trained a specific model to do whatever the thing is that product does like more effectively, right? And that's how you're going to create differentiation. Like you're going to own the weights. That's going to be the only way that you have product differentiation. And then I think the other thing, but that the challenge with that is that it's, you just got to spend money, right? If you want to train a model, we were looking at doing like a, a custom like clip model, right? Like training it off of the best performing clips and then like uh-huh. owning that. And we got quoted like a million five to do it. And so that, which is great is it's, that's a fuck ton of money. So you create like a moat from that. <laughs> but the challenge with it is you have to like, that has to be economically feasible. That's like the challenge with it all. So I think on the content side though, where it gets really interesting is it's very hard to strip away 
Like I can go and I can find the site map of a competitor's website and I can spin up every, I can spin up a blog post for every blog post that they have <laughs> within the next 48 hours, right? Like I've literally done this, but in contrast, it's way easier or sorry, it's way harder to go and be like, how do I cannibalize the search volume for a brand name? And so getting back to your thing, like what you're asking, I, I personally would be like, how do I open this thing up and just let it, as long as it's cost effective, yeah. you know, but and I could see friends going and analyzing or just like people going and analyzing influencers, what they're saying, just influencers trying to understand their audience better. That's brands in particular all day long. Like I, I, I think it's crazy that you're not looking at e-com brands as an example, as like a, a channel of they're trying to understand what their problem, the problems are with their customers. And a lot of times people take the social media to tell them like what they wish they were doing better. So that that's been a whole other kind of opportunity that's opened up like right now we're talking to a lot of like it's like more market research focused folks or like adjacent marketing and comms firm that's oh we just put on this big event for like this like big name client or whatever and we want to see all the social media chatter around it so it's more like of those research oriented like traditionally re- research oriented folks totally. but you're right that any brand that i'm operates just thinking about online, youtubers right like i'm yeah. thinking about what's plant daddy's real name kevin esperado oh. or something oh yeah i know yeah. exactly what like, you're talking I about think yeah. for him that would be a no-brainer of like what are my customers asking for that i can then go and create or find a product for that i can sell my e-com store like that that to me is that's a huge opportunity from an expansion revenue standpoint. Again, it's more and more. I'm like that, that type of customer though is self-service. They, it's just all they have access to is tutorials and that type of thing. Like you're, you're not, it's, you're not doing sales calls with them. Yeah. But that, that and that's, that's the constraint. Cause like we, just because we are like a smaller team right now, we've been able to build for those. It's like the more high touch, yeah. higher contract value customers. But what you're describing, it's, I'm basically trying to find some middle ground for now where I can almost enable, it's not quite a self-serve thing, but if I could go to 10 or 100 influencers and basically do what I would think of as like content enablement for them, yo, we have this really cool tool. It can tell you all this really cool stuff about your content or your competitor's content or whatever. And then you can take that as an influencer or creator and create cool content based on that. And then yep. also our brand name is featured in there. Totally. That's the next play. That's the next play that I'm looking at. And we actually have one of those videos dropping tomorrow. So... We'll see how that nice one does. Man. I love it. That's a perfect place <laughs> to leave it. <laughs> Zach, if you want to reach out to where do they, where do they, where are you most active and where can they find you? Find me on LinkedIn, honestly. Never thought I'd be saying that, but here I am. <laughs> uh, find me on LinkedIn. My my 20 year old self is like hating me right now, but find me on LinkedIn, Zach Wright, <laughs> and then check out what we're doing at Reveal you sell AI. Out. You fucking uh, sell out. <laughs> I know, dude. I suck. I suck so bad, but, uh, but yeah, check out, you can find me on there, connect with me. And then, yeah, if, it, especially if you're like a, if you're an influencer, if you're a marketer, if you're a, any sort of content creator and you're like, yo, this social listening, social research thing sounds cool. Hit me up and we'll just find a way for you to demo it for free or try it out for free. And maybe we'll just ask you to make a piece of content that like shouts us out or something. But that's, I want to basically give that hook up to as many people as we can. So just hit me up, find me on LinkedIn. We'll get it going. Awesome. Sweet, man. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate your time. Heck yeah. Thank you, Cody. This was awesome, dude. Thank you so much. I really had a lot of fun. Absolutely, brother.